This is part one of the two lectures based on my book Cantor's Error. Anyone who has some knowledge on infinity knows that the current theory of infinity, which is based on the works of Gero Cantor, is riddled with many paradoxes which are both counterintuitive and inconsistent. The beauty of mathematics is in its logic and consistency. Therefore, we should question whether there is any fallacy. This book will show the fallacies in the current theory of infinity and will correct them by proper reasoning. You can download the book from this site and I hope you read the book before watching this video. The book is divided into two parts. Part 1 discusses paradoxes present in the current theory of infinity and part 2 discusses how fallacies in reasoning led to those paradoxes and the book will rectify those counterintuitive paradoxes. If you want to know why and how I wrote this book, you may want to read afterward first. David Hilbert remarked, a mathematical theory is not to be considered complete until you can explain it to the first person you meet on the street. I try to follow his advice and I hope anyone who can count can follow my discussion. If you do not agree with me and find an error in my discussion, it is great. But if you do not understand my discussion, I'll take it as my failure. By the way, Hilbert is closely related to this, to this topic infinity because he was a strong defender of Cantor, described Hilbert curve, there is a part of the book, and the very first in the Hilbert 23 problems is the continuum hypothesis that will be discussed also in the book. Some of you may be an expert in the theory of infinity. However, I'll give a detailed explanation of the current theory because others may not be so well informed. And as Eric Bishop said, we need to know what the problem is before we try to solve it. Chapter 1-1, Paradox of Infinity, or part is the same as the whole. There is no largest natural number. Assume that there is a largest natural number n. Given any candidate as the largest natural number, we can construct a larger natural number like n plus 1. Thus, the natural number n is infinite so that the cardinality of natural numbers which is the number of the natural numbers, is infinite in size. This cardinality of natural numbers was denoted as aleph no by Gerold Cantor. In order to compare the size of sets with infinite elements, we use the method of one-to-one -one pairing. In this presentation, I'll be using videos that I downloaded from pbs.org and 3b1b because they are doing an excellent job explaining the topic. The first video is from PBS Infinite Series explaining the concept of one-to-one -one pairing. There's more than one size of infinity. In fact, there are infinitely many sizes of infinity. Lots of things come in different sizes. Five is bigger than four, humans are bigger than mice. Infinity is no different. Some infinities are bigger and some are smaller. It isn't just one monolithic concept. It occurs in different forms and sizes. So what are all these infinities? The smallest kind of infinity is the natural numbers. Zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Some people call these the counting numbers. Your intuition might say that the size of the even numbers is a smaller infinity than that of the natural numbers. We got rid of all the odd numbers, which feels like it shrinks the set, but the even numbers and the natural numbers are actually the same size. Intuition in mathematics is tricky and often misleading. To avoid being led astray, mathematics uses precise definitions and rigorous logic. We have to figure out exactly what it means for an infinity to be bigger than another infinity. So how do we do this? With finite quantities, it's simple. 
If I gave you two bags of pennies and asked which one was bigger, you'd just count the pennies. Easy. But we can't count to infinity, not even the smallest infinity. So we have to find a way of telling which infinity is bigger that doesn't rely on counting. We're going to have to use something called a bijection. What's that? Here's an example. Let's say you're sitting on a bus and notice that all the seats are taken, but no one's standing. Then you know that the number of people on the bus is equal to the number of seats on the bus. No counting needed. This is what mathematicians call a bijection. A bijection is a way of pairing elements from one set with elements from another set, and it proves that the two sets are the same size. There's a bijection, or pairing, between the seats and people. Each person is paired with the seat they're sitting in. It's also how I know I have the same number of fingers on both hands. I can pair them up. Got it? If you can pair up two sets, they're the same size. Let's go back to infinities. The natural numbers and the even numbers are the same size of infinity because there's a bijection between the two sets. Each natural number is paired up with two times itself. Everyone has a buddy. We kicked out all the odd numbers, but the set didn't get smaller. That's part of the weirdness of infinity. Here's another counterintuitive fact. The natural numbers are also the same size as the integers. The integers are all the whole numbers, including the negative ones. Here's the bijection that proves they're the same size. It helps not to think of bijections as a formula, but as a rule for pairing things in one set with things in another set. This diagram shows you the pattern, or rule, for pairing every integer with a natural number. The integers include all the natural numbers plus all the negative whole numbers. But we can pair them up exactly, so they must be the same size. So the even numbers and the integers belong at the bottom of the Tower of Infinities. As you saw in the video, we can one-to-one -one pair the natural numbers and even numbers when it is so obvious that there are more numbers in the natural numbers than even numbers. Thus, by this definition of comparing the size or cardinality, the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same as that of the even numbers even when we know that there are twice as many numbers in the natural numbers than in the even numbers. Thus, Aleph null equals twice the Aleph null. And this paradox was first discussed by Galilei Galileo, thus known as Galileo's paradox. Galileo was puzzled by the fact that natural numbers 1, 2, 3, dot dot dot, and their squares 1, 4, 9, dot dot dot, can be paired one to one, so that the number of the natural numbers and their squares may be the same even when it is obvious that there are non-square numbers in the natural numbers such that the number of natural numbers should be larger than the number of the squares. Thus, he concluded that the idea of comparing sizes applies only to finite numbers but not to infinity. However, Cantor defined comparing the sizes of the sets including infinity by one-to-one -one pairing. Then he showed that the size of the number of the natural numbers is the same as that of the rational numbers, which appears much larger than that of the natural numbers. Rational numbers are p over q of two natural numbers p and q. Thus, cardinality of rational numbers equals the cardina cardinality of natural numbers multiplied by cardinality of natural numbers, which is Aleph null multiplied by Aleph null, which is Aleph null squared. In order to have a successful one-to-one -one pairing, we need to have a well-ordered and complete listing of elements. It was easy in the case of natural numbers, even numbers, and integers. However, it is difficult to have an ordered and complete listing of rational numbers in this number line. But Cantor generated a complete and ordered set of rational numbers by this diagram. Let the, x let the x axis 
BD numerator and Y axis numerator. Rational numbers larger than zero can be ordered in a diagonal fashion. Any rational number larger than zero will be in the list. Then you can pair each rational number with each natural number by following the arrow. You need to skip some numbers that are the same as others, marked in X. Because you can one-to-one -one pair any rational number with a natural number, the size of the rational number is the same as that of the natural numbers. It is so obvious that there are many more numbers in the rational numbers than in natural numbers. Arithmetic shows the cardinality of rational numbers is aleph norm squared. However, it is the same as the cardinality of the natural numbers aleph norm. Thus, in this cardinal arithmetic, aleph norm squared equals aleph Then, it seems to make sense that infinity is infinity and all infinities are the same. However, Cantor showed that there is a larger infinity. Cantor showed that C, the size of the number of the real numbers, is larger than aleph norm, the size of the number of the natural numbers. It was a quite revolutionary finding that there are different sizes of infinities, one infinity being larger than the other infinity. The proof starts by considering real numbers in a unit interval as a set T of all infinite sequences of binary digits. Assume that T is countable. Then we can list all elements from T in a row. But when any S1, S2, da 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 is listed as elements from T, there is always an element S of T which is constructed by choosing the ith digit complementary to the ith digit in SI which corresponds to no SI in the listing. What does it mean? How do you make it? The first digit in S1 is 0. Thus, let the first digit of S be 1 which is complementary to 0. The second digit in S2 is 1. Thus, let the second digit of S be 0. The third digit in S3 is 0, thus let the third digit of S be 1, da da da. Then S is different from any SI in the list. Different from S1 in the first digit, different from S2 in the second digit, different from S3 in the third digit, da da da. Thus there is always an element of T which is not present in the list. This contradicts the original assumption, t being countable. Thus, t is uncountable by contradiction. Therefore, c, which is called t, which is 2 to the power aleph null by arithmetic, is uncountable. Thus, c equals c to the power aleph null, which is larger than aleph null. A finite interval re in real number line can be shown to have the same cardinality as the real number line itself, which is infinite in length. The equivalence of the cardinality of the real number line R with the interval minus 1 to 1 can be demonstrated geometrically. Draw a circle of radius 1 with a center C on the real number line a line passing through C and an arbitrary point P in R intersects the circle at X. The vertical line passing through X intersects the real number line at P prime. Thus, an arbitrary point P in R is one to one paired to P prime in the interval between minus one and one, demonstrating a bijection between P and P prime. Thus, the real number line itself, with infinite length, has the same cardinality of a finite interval. In general, the term infinite is used without clear definition of its size, even though it is implied tacitly as aleph norm. It will be proven that the length of the real number line is aleph norm in chapter 2-8 in lecture 2. 
Cantor theorem states, for any set A, the set of all subsets of A, including the empty set, which is the power set of A, has strictly greater cardinality than A itself. For finite sets, Cantor theorem is true by simple enumeration of the number of subsets, because 2 to the power n is larger than n for any positive integer n. Because Cantor theorem shows that there is no bijection between any set A and the power set of A even in infinity, he argued that the size of the power set of natural numbers n, which is, which is 2 to the power aleph null, should be strictly larger than the size of the set of natural numbers, which is aleph null. And 2 to the power aleph null happened to be c, the cardinality of real numbers. The next video from PBS will show the proof of Cantor theorem and the paradoxes that follow. Infinities come in different sizes. There's a whole tower of progressively larger sizes of infinity. So what's the right way to describe the size of that whole tower? Talking about the sizes of infinite things is tricky, in part because the word infinite is often used in two distinct ways, to refer on the one hand to the sets themselves, but also to refer to the sizes of those sets. Now, in what follows, let's try to keep as sharp a distinction as we can between infinite sets on the one hand and infinite set sizes on the other, because doing so will let me highlight an especially paradoxical feature about infinite sizing that I don't think gets enough coverage. Now, the technical term for a size, infinite or otherwise, is cardinality. And I should probably use a term like numerousness or numerosity rather than size, because the idea that we're trying to generalize is the notion of how many. Still, I'm going to say size a lot in this episode only because it's easier. Now, once you get a handle on infinite sizing, you end up with some pretty counterintuitive results, like that the set of the natural numbers and the set of all integers agree in cardinality while the cardinality of the real numbers is greater. Kelsey discussed a lot of this in a previous episode about the hierarchy of infinities, and it has good background information, so you might want to pause me and go check it out. You'll notice in that episode that Kelsey never defined the cardinality of an infinite set, never said what cardinality actually is explicitly. And I won't either, at least for today, for the simple reason that the arguments I want to lay out only require that we know how to compare the sizes of two sets, infinite or otherwise. And it turns out that there's a way to do that without knowing what either of the two sizes actually is. To borrow Kelsey's earlier analogy, suppose that there are some empty seats on a bus in which no one is standing. Well, we know the quantity of people is less than the quantity of seats, even though we don't know how big either quantity is. And if every seat is taken, then we know the quantities of people in seats are equal. In more formal language, suppose that you have a mapping from people, that's the input set, to seats. That's the output set, such that different inputs correspond to different outputs, which means no two people in the same seat. Mathematicians call this an injection. Now, if in addition, every element of the output set gets something mapped onto it, i.e. if every seat ends up with a person sitting in it, then we say that the map is onto or surjective. Now, if the map is not onto, like when some seats ended up empty, then the cardinality of people the input is less than the cardinality of the seats. But if the map is onto, which means no empty seats, then the map is a full-fledged one-to-one correspondence, also known as a bijection between the input and output sets, and the cardinalities of those sets have to be the same. Now notice in particular that if a set A is a subset of a set B, then A's cardinality has to be less than or equal to B's, since you can for sure inject A into B just by mapping each element of A to itself. It's good to note that these comparison rules are just motivated by what we know about the behavior of finite sets. And we're just stipulating obedience to these rules as a constraint on whatever ultimate definition we end up devising for cardinalities. So armed with these tools and terminology, let's make some observations. Notice that the size of the natural numbers has to be strictly greater than that of any finite set. How come? 
because you can map each element of a finite set to a distinct natural number. In other words, you can inject a finite set into the naturals, but you will always have naturals left over when you do so. The injection is not onto. The cardinality of the natural numbers, abbreviated with the symbol Aleph not, turns out to be the least infinite cardinality. And yeah, I know some people pronounce this Aleph no, I don't do that, tomato, tomato. There are also clever arguments due to Cantor that have been covered elsewhere on YouTube, showing that the sizes of the even natural numbers, the odds, all the integers, the rational numbers, and even algebraic irrationals like the square root of two, that all those sets are equal in size to Aleph not, even though the cardinality of the real numbers turns out to be greater than Aleph not. That's all fun stuff, but I wanna focus on something more narrow today, namely how the cardinality of a set A compares to that of its power set. The power set of A, which I'll denote P of A, is the set of all subsets of A, including A itself. So for example, if A is a set that has three elements called X, Y, and Z, then its power set will consist of the following two to the third, or eight, subsets of A. Now if you play with a couple of more examples like this, and if you take cardinality of finite sets just to mean quantity in the ordinary sense of the word, it becomes pretty clear that the cardinality of the power set is just two raised to the power of the cardinality of the original set. Fine. What's really cool is that even without explicitly defining cardinality for infinite sets, you can still show that the cardinality of the power set of A must be strictly greater than the cardinality of the original set A, even when it's infinite. Now for finite sets, that relation is obviously true. We just showed it. But to prove it for infinite sets, we're gonna use a beautiful argument that was first made back in the day by Cantor. I'm gonna go through this in two stages. The first thing to do is to show that the size of the set A has to be less than or equal to the size of its power set. In order to do that, we just need to find a function that maps each element of A to a distinct subset of A. Since remember, the subsets of A are the elements of the power set, i.e. that's the output set in this case. All right. How about a function that just maps each element of A to the subset of A containing only that element? That operation definitely sends each element of A to a distinct element of the power set. So then according to our comparison rules, the cardinality of the power set has to be at least the same as the cardinality of A. Now for the second step, we'll show that equal size is not an option. Namely, that no function g from a to its power set is onto. There will always be leftovers in the power set. Remember, inputs to g are elements of a, and the outputs of g are whole subsets of a. So for instance, g might map this element to this subset, or that element to that subset. Fine. Now consider a particular subset of a. Namely, the subset of elements, none of which are members of the subset that they get mapped to by g. Let's call this subset B. To illustrate, suppose that element Y is in B. Then the G operation can't map Y to this subset because Y is part of that subset. And it can't map Y to B because Y is also part of that subset. But it could map Y to this other subset that Y isn't a part of. Okay, now I claim that the subset B will never be the output of G. Why? Because what input would produce it? I mean, we just saw that elements like y that are in b can't get mapped to b because of how we define b. But what about an element like w that isn't in b? Well, since w isn't in b, then w has to be an element of whatever subset g maps w to. So g has to map w to a subset like this or like this, but it can't map w to b because w isn't in b. So the bottom line is that g can't map anything in b to b or anything that's not in B to B, which means B is never the output of the map G. But we didn't specify what rule G was, and our argument didn't depend on assuming that the set A was infinite versus finite, which means there's at least one subset of A, namely B, that no function that maps elements to subsets ever outputs, which means there's at least one element of the power set, B, that can never be spit out by such functions so that no mappings from A to its power set can ever be onto. But that means there's no bijections between A and P of A, which means their sizes can't be equal. Now, since we already saw that the size of A is less than or equal to that of P of A, the only remaining possibility is that the cardinality of P of A 
is strictly greater than that of A. Boom. So armed with this theorem, I want to consider the following specific never-ending chain of infinite sets. Let's start with the natural numbers n, followed by the power set of n, and then the power set of that power set, and so forth. Each link in this chain will have a cardinality that is strictly greater than that of all the previous ones, according to our theorem, which means there is no largest infinite size. But there's something else interesting. It looks like you can match up this list one to one with the naturals, which means that the cardinality of the totality of these cardinalities of that list is just Aleph naught. And that's interesting, because is this list of infinite cardinalities complete? If so, then the size of all infinities would be all if not. Alas, that's not the case, and here's why. Let's go back to the original list of sets, not the sizes, the sets, and let's form their union U. In other words, I want to take all the elements of the set N, all the elements from the set P of N, and from P of P of N, etc., and I want to aggregate all those elements into one big set U. Now there has to be an injective map from any of the power sets in the chain into U. Just send each element of that power set to its clone in U. That means that the cardinality of U has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of any of the power sets that were in the chain. But now think about the power set of U itself. That's also an infinite set. So by our earlier theorem, the cardinality of that has to be strictly greater than the cardinality of U which means by extension, it's greater than the cardinality of any of the original sets in our chain. And that means that there's at least one infinite cardinality, the size of the power set of U, that our original list missed, which means that list wasn't complete, and that the cardinality of the true collection C of all infinite cardinalities, whatever that is, has to be greater than all if not. Okay, so let's just push the question forward. What's the cardinality of this true collection of all infinite cardinalities. I'm not asking the size of the collection of the underlying sets, mind you. I'm asking about the size of the collection of the sizes. Let's just repeat our argument. For every cardinality in that collection, let's pick some actual set A that happens to have that size. And let's form the union U of those sets. Now, the infinite cardinality of U has to be at least as great as that of any of the A's that we union together to make it. Which means, once again, the cardinality of the power set of U will be strictly greater than all of those cardinalities. But wait a minute. The sizes of all the A's that we union together was supposed to be the totality of all infinite sizes. And that means that the size of the power set of U, which is an infinite set, so that's some infinite size, that was supposed to be one of the things in that totality. So we have a problem. The size of the totality of all infinite sizes is somehow greater than itself? That sounds highly problematic, reminiscent of something similar to Russell's paradox, but with a little bit of a different flavor. We seem to have hit a bit of a logical snag, so let's recap the facts that we know. Apparently, some infinite sets are bigger than others, because some infinite cardinalities are larger than others. Given any infinite set, you can always construct one of greater cardinality just by forming its power set over and over. We showed that there have to be infinite sets that have even larger cardinalities than any of those. But then when we ask, okay, how many infinite cardinalities are there altogether? The answer that we get back is nonsense, a contradiction. Rut row. What just happened? Did we encounter a logical problem with infinity itself? Or is the size of all infinite sizes actually just meaningless? Or did we do something else terribly wrong? You just saw that there are many paradoxes already. I'll discuss the proof of Cantor theorem again because this theorem is crucial in all the problems. This elegant proof is very short with just three lines. Theorem is let f be a map from set A to its power set PA. Then f mapping A to PA is not surjective. Thus, card A being smaller than card PA holds true for any set A. Proof is, in order to show card A being smaller than card PA, we need to show that there is an only injective function but no surjective function between 
A and P A. We need to demonstrate the existence of a subset A that is not equal to Fx for any x which is an element of A. Now, consider the set B whose element x is not an element of Fx. Suppose F is surjective. Then there exists epsilon such that F epsilon equals B. But by construction, epsilon is not an element of F, F epsilon. Thus, this is a contradiction. Thus, F cannot be surjective. On the other hand, function G mapping A to PA defined as X to itself is injective. Therefore, card PA is larger than card A. The concept of the set B is rather abstract, and thus I'll show B more visually. Set B, whose element X is not an element of Fx, is called contour diagonal set, and you'll see why. Suppose you have a list of Fi, which are the subsets of natural numbers here. F1 is an empty set, F2 is the set of all natural numbers, F3 even numbers, F4 odd numbers, dot dot dot. And then make a subset B of having X that is not an element in Fx, which is a definition of set B. Thus, because there is no 1 in as an element in F1, 1 is included as an element in B. This is what is meant by B, whose element X is not an element of Fx. There is 2 as an element in F2. Thus, 2 is not included as an element in B. There is no 3 as an element in F3. Thus, 3 is included as an element in B. Da, da, da. And then, B is different from any Fi in the list different from F1 in the first element, different from F2 in the second element, different from F3 in the third element, da da da. Thus, there is always a subset B of PA which is not present in the list. Then, you note the similarity between this contour diagonal set B in the contour theorem and S in the contour diagonal argument which can be seen more clearly by changing the presence or absence of each element in the set as 1 or 0. Then, Fi becomes a list of binary digits, and B becomes a number of binary digits, ith digit complementary to ith digit of the set Fi. The first digit in F1 is 0, thus the first digit in B is 1, the second digit in F2 is 1, thus the second digit in B is 0. The third digit in F3 is 0, thus the third digit in B is 1, da da da. Therefore, the set B, contour diagonal set in the proof in contour theorem is S in the contour diagonal argument. In other words, contour theorem is another expression of Cantor's diagonal argument. From this Cantor theorem, many paradoxes follow as you saw in the video. Card PA is larger than card A, including infinity, thus 2 to the power aleph null is larger than aleph null. Define path number 1 as card PN, which is 2 to the power aleph null. Define path I plus 1 as card P bet I, then bet 2 is larger than bet I, and bet I plus 1 is larger than bet I. Thus, Aleph null is smaller than bet 1 is smaller than bet 2, dot dot dot, leading to the conclusion that there are many sizes of infinity and there is no greatest infinite cardinality. The continuum hypothesis is whether there is no cardinal number between C and Aleph null. The next video from PBS will explain the conundrum in the proof. 
And as I said way back in the beginning of this episode, natural numbers are the smallest kind of infinity. But are there any bigger sizes of infinity? What goes on the tower above the natural numbers? The real numbers. That is, all the numbers on a number line, including those with infinitely many decimal places. Two-thirds, pi, one million, all of them. They belong further up the tower. You can choose to believe me, or if you want a technical proof, click on the link in the description where I lay it out for you. For now, let's stay focused on the task at hand, understanding the hierarchy of infinities. An interval on the real number line is also an infinite set. Intuitively, we tend to think that the interval from 0 to 10 is twice as big as the interval from 0 to 5. But amazingly, in terms of the tower of infinities, all intervals are the same size. They're all as big as the real numbers. Here's the bijection that shows that the interval from 0 to 1 is the same size as the real numbers. You can use the same idea to show that any interval is the same size as the entire real number line. We bent the interval into a semicircle. Then, each ray extending from the center of the semicircle pairs up a point on the interval with a point on the real number line. Again, everyone has a buddy, so it's a bijection. The interval 0, 1 is the same size as all the real numbers, and so they belong on the same spot on the hierarchy of infinities. So now we have a smallest infinity, the natural numbers, and a bigger one, the real numbers. The famous 19th century mathematician Georg Cantor wondered if there were any sizes of infinity that are between the natural numbers and the real numbers, and he noticed that it doesn't seem likely. Like Cantor, we tested a bunch of sets that seemed to be between the naturals and the reals, but the integers were smaller than expected, the same size as the natural numbers, and an interval was bigger than expected, the same size as the real numbers. These observations led Cantor to the continuum hypothesis. There's no size of infinity between the natural numbers and the real numbers. In other words, the natural numbers are the first block and the real numbers are the second block in the tower of infinities, and there's nothing in between. But here's the unexpected part about the continuum hypothesis. Decades after Cantor's conjecture, mathematicians proved that the continuum hypothesis is independent of zermelo frankel set theory with choice. In English, this means that the continuum hypothesis cannot be proved or disproved using the standard rules of mathematics, which is kind of crazy. Math is really into rules. That's kind of what some people don't like about it. But through creative applications of these rules, mathematicians have built an incredible and complex structure of ideas. The most basic set of nine rules, ZFC, can be used to prove statements like 2 plus 3 equals 5, and disprove statements like 2 plus 3 equals 6. These rules determine so many facts about our mathematical universe. But these rules cannot prove the continuum hypothesis, which would mean showing that the real numbers are the next size of infinity after the natural numbers, and they cannot disprove the continuum hypothesis, which would mean showing that there are sizes of infinity between the natural numbers and the real numbers. In one model of the Tower of Infinities, the real numbers sit directly above the natural numbers, like this. But in other models, there are many infinities in between, like this or this. The rules of math don't say that one tower is correct and the others are wrong. Mathematics proves so many things, simple statements, like 2 times 4 is 8, and complex ideas, like how to optimally pack spheres in 8-dimensional space. But despite all it's capable of proving, mathematics, as it stands, is surprisingly agnostic with regards to which hierarchy of infinities is correct. But if you have an opinion about it, let us know in the comments. We'll see you next week on Infinite Series. Here are the current rules of cardinal arithmetic. I'll explain only the ones that require some discussion. C multiplied by Aleph naught equals C. If you multiply between two different sizes of infinities, C and Aleph naught, the result will be C, which is a larger size. The proof requires some discussion in set theory. I'll refer the proof to the link because it takes time 
and most of discussion in the book does not need an in-depth knowledge in that theory. C multiplied by C equals C squared equals C from this cardinal arithmetic. The number of points in a two-dimensional space can be expressed as C multiplied by C. C is the number of points in a line, which is one dimension. Furthermore, C to the power I plus 1 equals C. Thus, I dimensional space of any integer I has the same number of points in a line, implying they have the same dimensionality, and this will be further discussed in the next chapter. Alpha over aleph naught equals zero. Consider small epsilon larger than one over n, and n becomes infinite. Then there's n satisfying one over n smaller than epsilon for any arbitrary small epsilon larger than zero. Because epsilon can be arbitrarily small, one over n becomes zero as n becomes infinite. In generic terms, Alef nor minus Alef nor and Alef nor over Alef nor are not determined because Alef nor can be the cardinality of natural numbers, even numbers, and rational numbers. We cannot determine the value of these in generic terms. Dimensionality paradox. In Euclidean or Cartesian geometry that we use every day, it is a common sense that a point, a line, a plane, and a space have a different dimension of 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. In the Cartesian coordinate system, a point in a line can be positioned in the straight line as x. A point in the plane can be positioned in the plane of two perpendicular axes as x, y. And a point in a space can be positioned in the space of three perpendicular axes as x, y, and z. This can be expanded to higher dimensional space of i. However, Cantor in 1878 proposed the proof that the number of points in a real number line is equal to the number of points in a plane or even i-dimensional space. This was a huge blow to our concept of dimension. The proof between one-dimensional unit interval and two-dimensional unit square is as follows, which can be easily expanded to i dimension. Let xy be an element of unit square and z be an element of unit interval. For any x, uh, which is 0.x1, x2, x3, da, 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 y, which is 0.y1, y2, y3, da, 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 there is a unique z, which is 0.x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, da, da, da. Thus, there is a bijection pairing between x, y, and z, which is a unit square and unit interval. However, this counterintuitive conclusion have a support by cardinal arithmetic too. Real numbers in the unit interval are considered as a set T as a set of all infinite sequences of digits. Because infinite here is considered as aleph null, it follows that C equals 2 to the power aleph null in the binary digit system. Then C squared equals C from this cardinal arithmetic. By induction, C to the I equals C for any finite positive integer i. This is highly counterintuitive and conflicted with our common sense Euclidean geometry. Thus, in a letter to Dedekind in 1877, before publishing the paper in 1878, Cantor wrote, I see it, but I don't believe it. Even though it was met with many skepticism, is now firmly established and forms the cornerstone of the modern point-set topology. In 1890, Giuseppe Piano defined the curve in a purely analytic way without reference to geometrical consideration 
that can provide a continuous mapping between points in the unit interval and the points in the unit square. Consider x and y representing the points in the unit square as continuous functions of the parameter z in the unit interval. x, y, and z are expressed in the base 3 number system. Let z as 0.a1a2a3 dot 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 x as 0.x1x2x3 dot 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 y as 0.y1y2y3 dot 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 As you note, x comes from odd numbered digits in the z and y comes from the even numbered digits in the z. With a special operator k defined as here, x and y changes by applying the operator k by n times. Because x, y, and z have the infinite digit length, every point of the square is covered and the correspondence is continuous by the base 3 number system proceeds. A geometric interpretation of a piano curve was presented by E. H. Moore in 1899 which appeared as a paper in 1900. It starts by dividing the unit square into nine subsquares with a diagonal line as in the figure. The second and successive iterations further subdivide each subsquare into nine sub-subsquares with diagonal lines. The line fills the square as the limit, so that this space filling curve became another proof that the number of points in a real number line is equal to the number of points in a plane. Another famous space filling curve is Hilbert curve. Hilbert curve is constructed by successive iterations of subdividing subsquares into four smaller subsquares. The smaller subsquares are connected by rotation reflection of the fundamental image given in the first square. The next video from 3B1B shows it. The term pseudo-Hilbert curve is used in the video because the limit is the Hilbert curve and not the finite iterations during the making. For an order one pseudo-Hilbert curve, you divide a square into a two by two grid and connect the center of the lower left quadrant to the center of the upper left over to the upper right and then down in the lower right. For an order 2 pseudo-Hilbert curve, rather than just going straight from one quadrant to another, we let our curve do a little work to fill out each quadrant while it does so. Specifically, subdivide the square further into a 4x4 grid, and we have our curve trace out a miniature order 1 pseudo-Hilbert curve inside each quadrant before it moves on to the next. If we left those mini-curves oriented as they are, Going from the end of the mini-curve in the lower left to the start of the mini-curve in the upper left requires this kind of awkward jump. Same deal with going from the upper right down to the lower right. So we flip the curves in the lower left and the lower right to make that connection shorter. Going from an order 2 to an order 3 pseudo-Hilbert curve is completely similar. You divide the square into an 8x8 grid, then you put an order 2 pseudo-Hilbert curve in each quadrant flip the lower left and the lower right ones appropriately, and then connect them all, tip to tail. And the pattern continues like that for higher orders. For the 256 by 256 pixel array, your mathematician friend explains, you would use an order 8 pseudo-Hilbert curve. Hilbert curve has a very interesting feature of preserving locality. You will appreciate that the color in the line tends to be localized in a certain region with recursive iterations, meaning that the neighbors in the line are preserved. Basic idea of the proof that Hilbert curve is, is specifying is that the maximal distance between a point in the subsquare and the Hilbert curve in the subsquare becomes zero, thus they are equal. After nth iteration, there will be 4 to the power n subsquares with a side length of 2 to the power minus n. Let xy be a point in a subsquare of the grid. 
Then, the maximal distance between a point xy and the nearest point in Hilbert curve fn, as denoted fn minus xy, is square root 2 multiplied by 2 to the power minus n plus 2. As n becomes large, the distance becomes smaller. For any arbitrary small epsilon larger than 0, there can be n satisfying square root 2 multiplied by 2 to the power n plus 2 uh, is smaller than epsilon. Thus, fn minus xy is smaller than or equal to epsilon for any arbitrary small epsilon larger than 0. Therefore, the distance between any point in the subsphere and Hilbert curve in the subsphere becomes 0. Cantor set Cantor set is generated by iteratively deleting the open middle third in a real, real number line segment. You will see that it has zero length, but there are infinite number of points within this zero length, as you see in the next video from PBS Infinite Series. Before we get to Cantor's function, aka the devil's staircase, let's start with the Cantor set. A set is just a collection of numbers, but the Cantor set, named after Georg Cantor, is a particularly weird collection. Let's construct the Cantor set in stages. Stage zero is the closed interval zero to one. The fact that it's closed, indicated with square brackets, means that the interval includes the endpoints zero and one. In stage one, remove the middle third, the open interval one third to two thirds. That leaves us with zero to one third and two thirds to one. In stage two, we're going to remove the middle third from each of those two pieces. So we remove one ninth to two ninths and seven ninths to eight ninths. This leaves us with four pieces. Zero to one ninth, two ninths to one third, two thirds to seven ninths, and eight ninths to one. In stage three, we remove the middle third from each of these, which leaves us with eight intervals of size 1 27th. And then we keep doing this on and on. The collection of points that are left after infinitely many stages is known as the Cantor set. But are there any points left? We just kept removing middle thirds over and over again. Maybe we removed everything. Amazingly, we didn't. There are still plenty of points left after infinitely many stages. And if we look at the construction of the Cantor set with a new perspective, by viewing the numbers in base three, we'll be able to see exactly which points remain. For this construction, we'll have to use base three numbers. Pick a point between zero and one and mark it with an X. In base 10, we'd label this point 0 0.4273, which means it has four tenths plus two hundredths plus seven thousandths plus three ten thousandths. It's also a recipe for how to zoom in on it. Divide the interval into 10 pieces, then look at the part between the fourth and the fifth mark, between four tenths and five tenths. Divide that into 10 pieces, then look at the part between the second and third mark, between 0 0.42 and 0 0.43. You can keep zooming in dividing by tenths. Well, the same thing works in base three. The same point labeled in base three is 0 0.10211211. That means it's 1 third plus 0 ninths plus 2 27ths plus 181st and so on. Instead of powers of 10, the decimal places are powers of three. But interpreting it as a recipe for how to zoom in still works. Divide the interval into three pieces, then look between the first and the second mark, between one third and two thirds. Divide that into three pieces, then look between the zeroth and first mark, between 0 0.10 and 0 0.11. Again, you can keep zooming in that way and you'll eventually find the point. Back to the Cantor set. Let's look at the set in base three as we go through the stages of the construction of the Cantor set. At stage zero, we have the whole interval. At stage one, we remove the middle third, which are all the numbers with a one in the first place after the decimal. At stage two, 
we remove the next middle thirds, which are all the numbers with a one in the second place after the decimal. At stage three, we remove all the numbers with a one in the third place after the decimal. So, what remains after infinitely many stages, the Cantor set, is exactly all the points whose base three expansion contains no ones. Not only is the Cantor set not empty, it contains tons and tons of points, and they're easy to write down in base three. Notice that the Cantor set is a fractal, or self-similar, in the sense that you can zoom in on it, and it will look exactly like the whole set. How big is the Cantor set? How many numbers are in it? The weird part about the Cantor set is that it fits one mathematical definition of being big and another mathematical definition of being small. Here's the sense in which it's big. The Cantor set is uncountable. Remember from our episode, A Hierarchy of Infinities, that there's a smallest infinity, countable, and bigger infinities, uncountable. Here's your challenge problem for the day. Give a proof of the uncountability of the Cantor set. Show that it's not the smallest infinity. In this sense, it's just as big as the interval we extracted it from. They're both uncountable. But here's the sense in which the Cantor set is small. It has length zero. The mathematical formalization of your intuitive notion of length is called the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure. But right now, I'll just call it length. Let's look at the length of the Cantor set in stages. At stage zero, it's the interval zero to one. So it has length one. At each stage after this, we remove one third of the previous set, leaving a set that is two thirds the length. So at stage one, the set has length two thirds. At stage two, the set is two thirds the length of that set. So it has length two thirds times two thirds, or four ninths. The set is always two thirds the length of the previous set. Continuing this, at stage n, the set has length two thirds to the n. The Cantor set is produced after infinitely many stages. So the length of the Cantor set is the limit as n goes to infinity of two thirds to the n, which is zero. Basically, the Cantor set is weird. It's uncountably big, but has zero length. It actually has a ton of other weird properties, several other episodes worth. But for now, let's talk about the Cantor function, also known as the devil's staircase. Describing the Cantor function, which is a function on the interval zero one, is a lot like describing the Cantor set. We build it in stages. At stage zero, the function is just a line extending from zero to one. The function at stage one has a flat line at height one half for the middle third, between one third and two thirds, and two diagonal lines to fill it in. Again, the function starts at zero and ends at one. At stage two, we add two more flat lines, one at height one quarter from one ninth to two ninths, and one at height three quarters from seven ninths to eight ninths. Notice that these two flat lines are the middle third of the diagonal segments from stage one. And now we add in diagonal lines to fill it in, starting at zero and ending at one. At stage three, we add in four more flat lines like this. For each diagonal line in the previous stage, we replace its middle third with a flat line at the midpoint of its height, then fill in the remainder with diagonal lines. Then you just keep doing this. The Cantor function is the function you end up with after infinitely many stages. We've broken up all the diagonal lines until they're infinitesimal, and we're left with all these flat line segments. Much like the Cantor set, many of the properties of the Cantor function seem in tension with each other. The Cantor function starts at zero and ends at one, so it has a vertical increase of one unit. But the function is flat, that is, it has zero slope, at every point besides the points in the Cantor set. The Cantor set has zero length, so all the points that are not in the Cantor set must have length one. So at almost every point, all the ones that are not in the Cantor set, the function is simply moving horizontally. It's making no vertical progress, but still 
it moves vertically by one unit. So all the vertical movement of the Cantor function happens at the points in the Cantor set. If you asked me to draw a function on the interval 0, 1 that has zero slope except at some discrete points and moves vertically one unit, I would probably draw something like this or this. This is basically like drawing a staircase. It needs to be flat so things don't roll off, but it also needs to make vertical leaps at certain points so we can actually climb upward. But staircases are not continuous functions. Continuous functions, which are intuitively functions you can draw without lifting your pen off the paper, cannot have vertical leaps like this. So, is it possible to draw a continuous staircase? Yes, the devil's staircase. The Cantor function is a continuous function. It does not have any vertical leaps. All of its vertical motion is contained within the tiny zero length Cantor set, but it still manages to climb up one unit without ever making a vertical leap. As you saw in the video, Cantor set are number points which have no ones in the base extension other than in the last digit. One is allowed in the last digit. What will be the number of points in the counter set? Counter set in the base 3 number system is all points which have no ones in the base extension other than in the last digit. Therefore, if we change the 2's in the base extension into 1, the counter set becomes the set of infinite binary sequences with a size of 2 to the power aleph null. And the length, Lubeck measure of counter set is 0. The total length removed is the sum of geometric progression, which is 1. The length of the remaining segment equals total length minus total length removed equals 1 minus 1 equals 0. Sum of the geometric progression is a simple high school math. The core of the formula is that r to the power n plus 1 becomes 0 for r smaller than r smaller than 1. The product in counter set is it contains infinite number of points when its length is 0. The number of segments in counter set is 2 to the power Aleph null. Thus, the number of endpoints in counter set equals 2 to the power Aleph null multiplied by 2, which equals 2 to the power Aleph null. But what will be the number of points within the segments? Will there be any numbers within the length of 0? The elements in the set X of endpoint numbers in the base 10 number system is X which becomes a natural number when multiplied by 3 to the power i. 1 over 4 is not a multiple of any power of 1 over 3, thus cannot be an element of x. In the base 3 number system, 1 over 4 is 0 0.020202 dot 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 with repeating 02, which is 0 0.02 bar. Because it does not contain 1 in the digits, 1 over 4 is in counter set. y, which is 1 over n, when n is not 3 to the i for any integer i, is not an element of x, even though this property does not guarantee that y will be in the counter set. Irrational numbers cannot be an element of x. Suppose n is an irrational number, so that it is not p over q, for any natural number p and q. Assume that n is an element of x. Then n multiplied by 3 to the i will be a natural number. Then n equals p over 3 to the i for some p. As 3 to the power i is a natural number, it contradicts the assumption that n is not p over q for any natural number p and q. Therefore, an irrational number z is not an element of x, even though it, this property does not guarantee 
that z will be in counter set. And let's examine the property of numbers within the segment. In each consecutive step, the middle segment with the final digit of 1 on the left margin and 2 on the right margin is removed, leaving the right end point of the remaining segment on the left with the final digit of 1 and the left end point of the remaining segment on the right with the final digit of 2. The left end point of the segment in counter set is the number that terminates with 2 and the right end point is the number that terminates with 1. Therefore, a number with non-terminating sequence of zeros and twos will be within the segment. If, when, if we change the twos in the base extension of a number with non-terminating sequence of zeros and twos into one, the set of the numbers with non-terminating sequences zeros and twos becomes the set of infinite binary sequences with a size of 2 to the power aleph null. Thus, the cardinality of the numbers within the segment is 2 to the power aleph null. So the paradox in counter set is it has no length but contains an infinite number of points not just in the end but also within the interval of zero lengths. As Cantor function, the devil staircase was presented so well in the previous video, I will skip the discussion. I just want to mention that this is a very popular topic and appeared in the blog in the Scientific American twice. A Vitali set is considered as a classic example of Lubeck non-measurable set and the next video from PBS Infinite series will discuss how it is made and what is the paradox. Does every set or collection of numbers have a size, a length or a width? In other words, is it possible for a set to be sizeless? Let's start with sets that do have a well-defined notion of size. Technically, in mathematics, we call size the Lebesgue measure. It formalizes the notion of length in one dimension, area in two dimensions, and volume in three dimensions. We'll use this notation to mean the size of a set S. Pretty much everything about the Lebesgue measure feels intuitive. The size of this line segment that extends from 0 to 3 is 3, and the size of this single point is 0. If we know this set has size 2, and we slide it over, it should still have size 2. That property is called translation invariance. The size of these two disjoint line segments, meaning that the two line segments don't have any points in common, is just the sum of their two sizes. That property is called additivity. In fact, if we take the union, or combine together, countably many disjoint sets, their sizes still add. That's called countable additivity. Since a single point has size zero, countable additivity tells us that any countable collection of points, like all the integers, also has size zero. After all, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is just zero. But an interval, like zero to one, contains uncountably many points. We can't simply add together uncountably many zeros, and so its size is not just the sum of the size of the points. This definition of size, using the Lebesgue measure, is quite robust. Pretty much any set you can think of has a well-defined size. In fact, it was quite the challenge for mathematicians to devise a set without a size. So, how do you create such a set? Start with the interval 0 to 1. We're going to sort all the numbers in the interval into bins in a sort of unusual way. There will be infinitely many bins. We're going to put all the numbers whose difference is rational in the same bin. In other words, look at two numbers in our interval x and y. If x minus y is a rational number, they go in the same bin. But if x minus y is an irrational number, they go in different bins. This is an example of separating things into equivalence classes. Let's look at these bins in a little more detail. 
If you take any two rationals and subtract one from another, you get a rational. So one bin will contain all the rational numbers, like one quarter and two thirds and 999 thousandths. But if you take any two irrationals and subtract one from another, the result might not be a rational number. So they can't all go in the same bin. We have to split the irrationals into mini bins. For example, one bin will contain the square root of two divided by two and all the numbers that differ from it by a rational, like the square root of two divided by two plus one one hundredths, and the square root of two divided by two minus one quarter. What about the square root of two divided by three? Well, the square root of two divided by two minus the square root of two divided by three is the square root of two divided by six, which is irrational. So the square root of two divided by three is in a different bin than the square root of two divided by two. In this way, all the numbers between zero and one show up in exactly one bin. One way to visualize the bins are as shifted copies of the rational numbers. All the rationals are in the first bin, but if we shift them over a little bit until one of the points hits the square root of two over two, then they become the contents of that bin. If we shift them again until one of the points hits the square root of two over three, then they become the contents of that bin. I want to be clear that this is a metaphor, a helpful visualization. Now, we'll form a new set S by selecting one representative from each bin. For example, S might contain one quarter from the first bin, square root of two over two from the second bin, and square root of two over three minus three tenths from the third bin, and so on. We don't know exactly what the contents of S are, but we know that it contains exactly one representative from each bin. Here's the big punchline. This new set S has no size. It's non-measurable. Let's explore why. The proof that S is non-measurable is a little tricky. So during this next segment, I'd encourage you to pause and rewatch whenever it's helpful. First, we'll list all the rational numbers between negative one and one, our one, our two, our three, and so on. Remember, there's countably many rational numbers, so it's no problem to make a list like this. Then we'll define a bunch of new sets, S1, S2, S3, and so on, which are essentially just copies of S shifted by the rational numbers, R1, R2, R3. To be more precise, here's how you define the set S1. Take each element in S and add R1 to it. The set S2 is defined by adding R2 to each element in S, and so on. So if we visualize S as a bunch of dots between zero and one, then each of the S1, S2, S3, and so on are just copies of S shifted a bit. They'll be between negative one and two. Let's make two crucial observations about these copies of S. First observation, they're disjoint. That means that there is no point which is in both SI and SJ for any two different numbers I and J. Second observation, every number between zero and one is in one of the copies of S. Every number between zero and one is in either S1 or S2 or S3 and so on. Your challenge problem for the week is to prove these two observations. Now, let's take the union of all the S1, S2, S3 and so on. In other words, we're gonna stick them all together. Because they're disjoint by the property of countable additivity, the size of the union is equal to the size of S1 plus the size of S2 plus the size of S3 and so on. We also know that the union is inside the interval negative one to two. So its size has to be less than three. But by the first observation, it includes the entire interval zero to one. So its size has to be bigger than one. In other words, the size of the union must be between one and three. Now, notice if S has a size, whatever that size may be, then each of the copies, S1, S2, S3, and so on, are also the same size as S. That's because they're just shifted copies of S, and by the property of translation invariance, shifting doesn't change size. Using our previous formula and the fact that the size of each S1, S2, S3, and so on is the same as the size of S, we now know that the size of the union of all the copies is just the size of S added to itself infinitely many times. This is a problem. We said that the size of the union of all the copies is between one and three. Whatever the size of S is, there's no way to 
add that number infinitely many times and get a number between 1 and 3. If the size of s is 0, then the infinite sum gives 0. And if the size of s is something positive, even a really tiny number, we'll still get infinity when we add it to itself infinitely many times. Therefore, the size of s can't be 0 and it can't be non-zero. It can't have a size. The set s must be non-measurable. Let's dive into one very important but subtle part of the definition of s. To construct a non-measurable set, a set without a well-defined notion of size, we used the axiom of choice. The historically controversial set theory axiom of choice states that, given a possibly infinite collection of non-empty sets, we can form a new set that contains one element from each set. In other words, we are choosing one element from each set. The frustrating part about the axiom of choice is that it doesn't tell us which element is being chosen. We don't know exactly what the contents of our new collection are. We used the axiom of choice early on when we selected one element from each bin to form the set S. zermelo frankel set theory is the standard axiomatic basis for mathematics. There are nine basic axioms and set theorists have spent the last century exploring what happens when you add other axioms, most noticeably the axiom of choice. Technically, two of these are schemas, which stand in for infinitely many axioms. The set S that we created is the most commonly presented non-measurable set. There are other options, but they all use the axiom of choice, or a similar axiom. In other words, using the basic ZF axioms, it's impossible to create a non-measurable set, a set without a size. A notable related result, and most people's favorite consequence of the axiom of choice, is the Banach-Tarski paradox. In the Banach-Tarski paradox, you take a solid sphere, break it into a finite number of pieces, actually as few as five pieces, depending on the construction, and then put those pieces back together to form two solid spheres, each the same size as the original. You have doubled the sphere. It's okay if that feels confusing. It's called a paradox for a reason. If you want to see the detailed construction, check out the Vsauce video linked in the description. The magic behind the Banach-Tarski paradox is in the axiom of choice. The pieces you break the sphere into are non-measurable. They require the axiom of choice, or something similar, to construct. For some people, this alleviates their sense of anxiety over the paradox. By invoking the axiom of choice and non-measurable sets, the Banach-Tarski paradox is outside the domain of our physical I will use V as the Vitali set rather than S. The key in the proof is that infinity multiplied by lambda V should be between 1 and 3. However, if V is measurable, lambda V has to have a certain number, but if lambda V is 0, then infinity multiplied by lambda V equals 0. If lambda V is larger than 0, then infinity multiplied by lambda v equals infinity. Therefore, lambda v cannot be either 0 or larger than 0. Therefore, it contradicts the assumption that v is measurable. This is a summary of the discussion that I had in part 1. In part 2, I will show that a correct theory of infinity has only products 1 and 2 and other paradoxes will be shown as a logical fallacy. Before ending part one of my presentation, I'd like to thank Gresham College Public Lecture Series to wake me up on this topic, Wikipedia for providing me with most of the information that was necessary, pbs.org and 3b1b for their excellent videos and other educational materials. They allowed me to see the problem more clearly. So I thank them infinitely. Uh, these are treasures in our National Museum. On the left is a scent burner and on the right is a meditating Buddha. Both are from around 7th century CE and their cultural heritage will last to infinity. Thank you very much.